Look, it's, it's a privilege for me to be back here. Um, it's not often you can come back to a building 10 years later um, and have it looking like this, I think, and have so much life in it. It was 15 years ago um, that we started working on this project. And 15 years ago, um, as you made your way around the old Rum Hospital building on Macquarie Street, you were confronted by a very unusual place right in the middle of Sydney. It was a, a quiet courtyard surrounded by uh, trees and broken bits of sandstone, uh, fibre cement, uh, actually asbestos cement, sheet buildings um, of the 19th century. And through the roof of these structures, water dripped. There was muck on the floor. There were bits of wood and stone. It was, in fact, a ruin um, right behind Macquarie Street 15 years ago. Uh, extraordinary place. You could still go into it, um, but these buildings uh, of the old coining factory were a ruin. So this, as we have heard today, was the central courtyard and factory buildings of the historic uh, 1850s mint. Um, and it is one of the most precious and significant uh, heritage sites that we have in Sydney. Um, and yet such a short time ago, it was uh, just decaying, you know, right on our doorstep. So our capacity to neglect the things that we value, and perhaps in a sense it's a story of our lives themselves, is incredible. But within these images of uh, broken and neglected architecture, there was great beauty. In a sense, you know, as much beauty in the broken pieces as in the pieces that survived. It was a very special place and it had a unique and very hidden character. Finally, proportions facades created a protected courtyard from Sydney's busy streets and it's unusual to find that in Sydney. Sydney's block structure is so narrow and so fine, our streets so irregular, that it's very difficult to create courtyards to protect us from the street. Um, but this is one of them here, of course. It started out as a very different purpose, as purpose of security, and now it offers a different type of security. And here, 15 years ago, you could see the profile roof of the barracks beyond and the Slightly ironically, you could see the spires of St Mary's Cathedral and you could get a kind of glimpse of uh, the colonial city of Sydney. But as I said, there was enormous beauty in the fact that it had been torn and it had been ruined. So to revitalise this place, we had to develop an approach of carefully weaving new and contemporary architecture and technology within the existing. And we had to think about how new could meet old, but also, importantly, we had to create new life, as Mark was saying. Um, this was a place transformed from a courtyard precinct to keep the public out to the embrace of events and ceremony and the sharing of knowledge. So at each moment, the materials and the forms of the new were going to be in juxtaposition with the old. And we had to think very carefully about this. We, we had to think carefully about contrast and about complement to create a greater transparency and openness and to transform a walled courtyard for industrial production into a celebratory and inviting public space that it was started out as the campus for the Historic Houses Trust and now Sydney living museum. So of course we uh, researched this project uh, a great deal um, 15 years ago and we worked very closely with the experts at what was Historic Houses Trust and with a range of uh, advisors and consultants. Um, enormous debate went into the development of this project and I, I'll only hint at a few aspects of it for you. 
What you see there is a little sketch diagram of the idealized version of uh, the mint that Joseph Trickett uh, uh, actually occupied, and it did exist like this for a very small, uh, brief moment. Um, and it was a symmetrical organization of a sandstone industrial complex with a very proud superintendent's pavilion right here next to me, um, sitting behind the Rum Hospital building. Now, I've just left out a lot of the historical evolution of that uh, in incredible complex because it was very soon filled up with different bits of buildings and aggregations all over it and adjustments of all sorts of varying quality. But one of the most uh, violent acts on this site was the tearing down of the northern wing of the building to create a surface grade car park uh, that I would think would be one of the most inefficient car parks in Sydney. Um, but there it is, that happened, 1960, that went, not, not very long ago at all. So we had to think, what do we do? What do we do now? And, um, you know, 15 years ago, and perhaps we'll touch on how our thinking and values about heritage change, but there was a great challenge to us as architects and designers. There's enormous um, temptation to restore, to put things back as they were, um, and to forget some of the violence that has occurred. But we wanted to find a completely different form of transformation. And, and we looked at the difference between the old hospital buildings with its symmetry, but its off symmetry, how it related to Trickett's completely symmetrical building behind, although, of course, the door to the superintendent's pavilion is set to one side, a little bit of imperfection to get in. Um, and we thought we could reorganize it in a new way um, that in fact, made the existing buildings more articulate and could add another layer to them. And so what you'll see in the sketch is that you see that where those crosses are, um, uh, the first of those, the central of those, is the superintendent's pavilion. And next to it, there is a new pavilion, which is the one we're sitting in now. So our concept was to create a new form of exactly the same proportions as the central superintendent's pavilion, um, but of a completely different nature and materials. And that these two pavilions would set up a new line of symmetry that actually ran through the old line of entry of the Rum Hospital. Um, and in doing so, then there wasn't this kind of static symmetry to the space. There was a, a, a much more open kind of dual symmetry and pairing and I always thought about this as the creation of a sister pavilion to the existing brother, uh, and that there would be this kind of um, dialectic between them, that, that there would be a contrast between the solidity of the superintendent's pavilion and the transparency and lightness of the pavilion that we're in now. And it's kind of strange showing you know, usually I show building pictures of the work that we have done, including this building, not in the building. Uh, <laughs> so I kind of pointing out the obvious to you in a sense, but um, if, you have to make sure images don't lie when you're doing this, of course, because the real thing is here. So there were this brother and, and sister pavilion, and we, and we also thought carefully about its material quality, you know, and uh, the, the, the pavilion that we're in is, is light, it's expressed as being light. In fact, it's actually quite heavy, you know, there's sitting up above us here, there's uh, a book and artifacts uh, repository. Um, it's very highly serviced, but the building's expressed as light and it sits over the archeological uh, remains, so it has to be light. You know, there's always this um, kind of paradox in architecture where we seek to reverse things. We actually are making something that's quite heavy, uh, but we want it to be light. And its nature is right. It's kind of expressing the nature of a building that becomes important. And so lifting this roof up like this not only allows this room to address the courtyard, but actually makes exact the proportional relationship between these two buildings. And all of this is not just a formal piece of work that the architect might, might undertake, but it relates to the purpose, the repurposing of these buildings. And, and, and I'm sure we will discuss how important purpose use is 
and social history is to heritage, but here you can see the superintendent's pavilion, which has been transformed into uh, the Carolyn Simpson Library. So in a sense, we put the library there because we need to protect what's in the library. And what happens in the library is a process of reflection and study. So, so we put that and we articulated that space as exactly the superintendent's pavilion. And here you see the miniature Joseph Paxton's glass house tra transferred almost literally to Sydney from London, extraordinary structure. Uh, that's preserved in the upper level of the library next door. And the way you can look from that library uh, across the workspace of the, of, of, of the uh, environment through the kind of quite extraordinary truss structure there, if you look really hard, you can see some bits of steel that we've added in to stop it collapsing. Um, it was, in fact, very unstable um, 15 years ago. But the complement to this pavilion, both architecturally in terms of urban design and in terms of use, is the room we're in now, which is intended as a room for discussion, for debate, in fact exactly what's happening now, but also celebration and, and, and for life. And in a way we're going to transfer what happens here, over there, in some form, in some archive, will get transferred into here. So this is where there's the generation of knowledge, in a sense, and this is where there's the storage of knowledge, and this is where there's a celebration and an investigation. So you're in that room, so you can, <laughs> you can get a sense of what happens there. But also, you know, money is really tight. Um, so space is really tight. So I originally wanted this whole room to be two stories, you know, um, but, but we had to have book repository space, we had to slide something in over here. You can see a glass bridge that leads from the corridor from the Carolyn Simpson Library into this space here. That space is highly serviced, highly controlled environment for the storage of sensitive artefacts so they couldn't go in a heritage fabric building without the services destroying it, so they had to go in this new bit. So we just bent this kind of ceiling up. Um, and in ways better, the room orientates out to the courtyard and it has this softness to it. And importantly, we could afford it at that point. It's a familiar story, isn't it? You know, when we hear about decisions made about the mint and about the hospital driven by cost and, 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 and here we are again, the same thing. And one of the most important things about this room was to open it to the courtyard. You know, the original brief for this room was a black box space raked auditorium and we ended up with a flat floor room that opens out onto the courtyard here and you lift up all of these things here um, to make that happen. And part of that was trying to think about a room like this in a different way. So. You can close all, oh, they are closed, of course, so they're closed, and so from the outside it looks like this. Um, but we could open up the bottom bit and, and look out, or if we chose to, and we could actually uh, uh, do this, is we can open it all up. Or actually you can only open the top bit if we want to get natural light in over the top, and then all of the glass slides up for when we walk behind it. And, um, you know, that cost a lot of money. It was very difficult to persuade people to do that. Um, and we had that separately costed, separately tendered, and the call to do it was a last minute thing, but would certainly stand up to a value management review without a doubt. Because what it allows is that kind of incredible um, seamlessness between an event in the courtyard and an event within the building itself. The other question was what to do with the northern wing, how to put that back. And there were previous schemes generated for the Mint that pretty much held all of the lines of the existing building, pretty much restored it, in fact. So ours at the time, you have to imagine, was quite confronting for people. And here we wanted to create a building that just held the, the kind of parapet line of what you see in the northern pavilion, but that was glass, that was completely transparent. One of our reasons for that was that uh, we wanted this room to engage with the courtyard, 
but we also didn't want it to in, in, impede views to that boundary wall that ran along the edge of the hospital and that had weeds growing out of it. You can see in my photograph it's still got weeds growing out of it. And I haven't checked, but we didn't kill any of those weeds in the... And uh, it's all naturally ventilated, so they use those little growths coming out of the wall. We managed to still preserve those. Uh, and, and to do that, we had to protect that wall, so the new roof sits over the top of the bounding wall, just on this side. That might sound a really simple thing to do, but it was one of the most difficult things we had to do, because we had to build a new roof right on a boundary with the hospital. And that was an endless negotiation to get that approved. But important because, in a way, what some of this new building is doing is it's sheltering and preserving the old without touching it. So ultimately, our concept really was what we call additive. It was about dropping in a series of new pieces, a few discrete pieces that kind of make all of this thing whole again and that in a sort of collage sense, maybe make it complete. And you can see what the key ones are, and of course there are a few others, I won't go through them all, but one of them is that big long roof that sits along that edge, and you can see in this image actually through, almost through to the domain. And, and when we did this project, it was very, very limited, but we had this idea that maybe you might walk through here to the domain one day, maybe the thinking would change. Um, and, and that, in that sense, the work is open. So it's kind of ironic now that 15 years later, um, engaging with um, this organisation again to, to look at something far more ambitious, in fact, than we had in mind, um, but that, that demonstrates, I think, the longevity of what is sound principles about our city and about the connection to parks and open spaces. Another one of these was the laneway that runs uh, on the southern side. Different periods of architecture uh, make themselves present along that laneway. It's a beautiful space, and I think with actually joining the barracks and the mint more closely will in fact become a, a, a centre almost. Um, but it includes a, uh, an, a stair structure here, which uh, from this stair, from the movement of people through this organisation, you can enjoy one of the most beautiful views, but also a view that includes the barracks and, and St Mary's. And we made this uh, like a little cocktail stick. You know, you, it's very difficult to figure out how all of that stands up, but it's still there. But what, in a sense, was at the core of this project was how things meet. Where's the empathy, where is the sympathy between the new and the existing. And to do that, we had to think very carefully about these adjacencies and about the nature of what we were putting here. Um, our objective is to put something that's absolutely at the edge of what we can do today to create beautiful environments that serve us well, um, but also we have a duty to try and create an architecture that is enduring and that 15 years later, people don't come here and say, well, you know, it was pretty good at the time, but, you know, it's had its day, we better take it down and renew it. It's a, it's a very difficult challenge for an architect and for a designer. So at the core of this project are these adjacencies. The way in which, for example, here, a glass window is oversized and just bolted to the wall so that the opening is actually preserved, the torn opening is preserved. The way in which all of the graffiti was maintained, the graffiti that no doubt was the work of the original builders, um, some of it I think was contributed by our own builders. <laughs> we left that too. And in here, in the reception area, you can, you can see that effect. So the framed uh, window on the right here is oversized and just bolted to the, the, the masonry so that from the other side, it just seems that there is a, a torn opening and a, and a room. And all of these different layers are revealed. And, and, and somehow in that, not only is that really eloquent in terms of its interpretation of the layers of history of this site and of this place, but also, in a sense, it has its own beauty. So 
so floors are held back from the edge to not butt up against the stone and allow the sandstone to continue to shed as it, as it will in the years to come. But we've sought to do this in a, with a sense of uh, empathy and, and, and love for these materials and for this work that's preceded us. The whole purpose is to create new life, not to create a museum, not to turn these buildings into an artifact in themselves. Um, and you know, I've worked on a few museums, you know, we always uh, have these discussions with conservators about objects decaying in uh, natural light, of course they do, watercolours in particular, but then if we lock them away and never look at them, they kind of don't have any value. So they're transient and and uh, it's a difficult one, it's difficult territory and, and very rich. And the diversity of events, and I, I, li I liked Mark's slides of the events that have gone on here, but what's happened in this courtyard is, um, has been wonderful to see. And the incredible breadth that it has embraced in terms of uh, those who've used it and celebrated within it. So, in a sense, we measured really carefully these buildings, we modelled them really carefully, and we aligned our work exactly to it. So we placed sheltering pieces of glass, carefully introduced steel members. Every moment we touch the building, you can see, we didn't hide our contribution, if you like, and we didn't hide where we've actually had to make interventions. And I chose this picture uh, because, of course, this is where the building was torn away. Um, and when we walked into the site uh, 15 years ago, it pretty much looked like that. You know, the blocks are sitting on the ground. You can see them out there. It's a ruin. But, you know, what is this uh, romance with the ruin? And all the care and research, preservation and lightness of hand is it in fact a fetishization of these remains? A kind of misplaced nostalgia that's really out of touch with the reality of our contemporary life and the challenges that we face, what we might call the zeitgeist. These ruins and this space, are they really out of touch? Where is the expression of the moment, of our time? Well, it's interesting because the zeitgeist and nostalgia are both about time. Two opposite poles, perhaps, of an attitude towards time, but in fact closer together than they first appear. The zeitgeist so frequently is the catch cry of the avant-garde, a nostalgia of the conservatives. But both are a resistance to time, to the flowing, equalizing, continuous motion of moments and events that is time. Both seek to distort time and to deny it. Both are romantic, a romance of memory and a romance of forgetting. Nostalgia, it's, it's a beautiful definition of nostalgia, actually I looked for a lot before I picked that one. Nostalgia wants desperately to remember what is already lost. It longs for the security of the past, what is known and understood, misses the solidity of an imagined romanticized past, and is warmed by the reassuring glow of age. Zeitgeist wants to forget. I know that's a very ambiguous image I've put there, but... <laughs> the zeitgeist wants to forget. It wants to fight and resist the pull of the past. It's obsessed with the new, the moment, thinking that itself will never become past, and is blinded by the shining and glittering image of youth. The shining flight of the zeitgeist and the grounded melancholy of nostalgia. 
the reaching for the clouds and the digging in the ground. Both are about time and seek to escape it and the confrontation that it holds for us. So back to our ruin for a moment. The ruin preserves the scars, the wounds and the violence against the stone. A record of our misdeeds, our misplaced values that could want to knock all this down merely for a surface car park. Our work is not to restore to an idealised state, to, but to preserve and to transform, to give new life and meaning to this place in relation to, and while at the same time preserving, the record of the past. But all this is not the whole story, because as an architect, I want a beautiful outcome. I want a wonderful and rich and complex and complete place. <coughs> I confess, I really wanted the asbestos cement sheds on the top gone. Right? It was a big debate at the time. <laughs> I really wanted them gone. I wanted the courtyard simultaneously restored and transformed. I wanted a new innovative architecture to complete this place, to frame and to create just as the original had at its moment. I wanted the new to support and embrace its aging and wiser partner of stone. But equally, I wanted the ruin. I wanted it left like the sandstone blocks had only just fallen. We'd not even moved them. Not for this record of violence and philistine, but for the sheer beauty of it, the moving presence of the ruin and the sense of loss that comforts us somehow. Reminds us that decay, decline also have value, that both youth and age have their beauty and that loss and death also have their place. That is a comfort. It is not the escape of time, but the acceptance and embrace of time and its limits for us. All this still remains a little hidden from Macquarie Street, behind the old Rum Hospital building, whose bicentennial we're celebrating today. But by way of invitation, we created this hovering roof, we pushed it out to Macquarie Street, very adventurous for us, because we wanted to create a sense of invitation for those passing by on Macquarie Street, beckoning them to come into this beautifully surprising place. Thank you.